The Prisoners, a short story by Guy de Maupassant. There was not a sound in the forest, save the indistinct fluttering sound of the snow falling on the trees. It had been snowing since noon, a little fine snow that covered the branches as with frozen moss and spread a silvery covering over the dead leaves in the ditches and covered the roads with a white, yielding carpet and made still more intense the boundless silence of this ocean of trees. Before the door of the forester's dwelling, a young woman, her arms bare to the elbow, was chopping wood with a hatchet on a block of stone. She was tall, slender, strong, a true girl of the woods, daughter and wife of a forester. A voice called from within the house. We are alone tonight, Berthine. You must come in. It is getting dark, and there may be Prussians or wolves about. I've just finished, mother replied the young woman, splitting as she spoke an immense log of wood with strong, deft blows, which expanded her chest each time she raised her arms to strike. Here I am. There's no need to be afraid. It's quite light still. Then she gathered up her sticks and logs, piled them in the chimney corner, went back to close the great oaken shutters, and finally came in, drawing behind her the heavy bolts of the door. Her mother, a wrinkled old woman whom age had rendered timid was spinning by the fireside. I am uneasy, she said, when your father's not here. Two women are not much good. Oh, said the younger woman, I'd cheerfully kill a wolf or a Prussian if it came to that. And she glanced at a heavy revolver hanging above the hearth. Her husband had been called upon to serve in the army at the beginning of the Prussian invasion, and the two women had remained alone with the old father, a keeper named Nicolas Pichon, sometimes called Long Legs, who refused obstinately to leave his home and take refuge in the town. This town was Rethel, an ancient stronghold built on a rock. Its inhabitants were patriotic and had made up their minds to resist the invaders, to fortify their native place, and, if need be, to stand a siege as in the good old days twice already, under Henri IV. And under Louis XIV, the people of Rethel had distinguished themselves by their heroic defence of their town. They would do as much now, by gad, or else be slaughtered within their own walls. They had therefore bought cannon and rifles, organised a militia, and formed themselves into battalions and companies, and now spent their time drilling all day long in the square. All bakers, Grocers, butchers, lawyers, carpenters, booksellers, chemists took their turn at military training at regular hours of the day, under the auspices of Monsieur Lavigne, a former non-commissioned officer in the Dragoons, now a draper, having married the daughter and inherited the business of Monsieur Ravaudon, senior. He had taken the rank of commanding officer in Rethel, and, seeing that all the young men had gone off to the war, he had enlisted all the others who were in favour of resisting an attack. Fat men now invariably walked the streets at a rapid pace to reduce their weight and improve their breathing, and weak men carried weights to strengthen their muscles, and they awaited the Prussians. But the Prussians did not appear. They were not far off, however, for twice already their scouts had penetrated as far as the forest dwelling of Nicolas Pichon, called Long Legs. The old keeper, who could run like a fox, had come and warned the town. The guns had been got ready, but the enemy had not shown themselves. Longleg's dwelling served as an outpost in the Aveline Forest. Twice a week the old man went to the town for provisions and brought the citizens news of the outlying district. On this particular day he had gone to announce the fact that a small detachment of German infantry had halted at his house the day before, about two o'clock in the afternoon, and had left again almost immediately. The non-commissioned officer in charge spoke French. When the old man set out like this, he took with him his dogs, two powerful animals with the jaws of lions, as a safeguard against the wolves, which were beginning to get fierce, and he left directions with the two women to barricade themselves securely within their dwelling as soon as night fell. The younger feared nothing, but her mother was always apprehensive and repeated continually. We'll come to grief one of these days. You see if we don't. This evening she was, if possible, more nervous than ever. 
Do you know what time your father will be back? She asked. Oh, not before eleven for certain. When he dines with the commandant, he's always late. And Berthine was hanging her pot over the fire to warm the soup when she suddenly stood still, listening attentively to a sound that had reached her through the chimney. There are people walking in the wood, she said. Seven or eight men at least. The terrified old woman stopped her spinning wheel and gasped. Oh my God, and your father not here. She had scarcely finished speaking when a succession of violent blows shook the door. As the woman made no reply, a loud, guttural voice shouted, Open the door! After a brief silence, the same voice repeated, Open the door, or I'll break it down. Berthine took the heavy revolver from its hook, slipped it into the pocket of her skirt, and putting her ear to the door, asked, Who are you? demanded the young woman. What do you want? The detachment that came here the other day, replied the voice. My men and I have lost our way in the forest since morning. Open the door or I'll break it down. The forester's daughter had no choice. She shot back the heavy bolts, threw open the ponderous shutter, and perceived in the wan light of the snow six men, six Prussian soldiers, the same who had visited the house the day before. What are you doing here at this time of night? she asked dauntlessly. I lost my bearings, replied the officer, lost them completely. Then I recognized this house. I've eaten nothing since morning, nor my men either. But I'm quite alone with my mother this evening, said Berthine. Never mind, replied the soldier, who seemed a decent sort of fellow. We won't do you any harm, but you must give us something to eat. We are nearly dead with hunger and fatigue. Then the girl moved aside. Come in, she said then entered, covered with snow, their helmets sprinkled with a creamy-looking froth which gave them the appearance of meringue. They seemed utterly worn out. The young woman pointed to the wooden benches on either side of the large table. Sit down, she said, and I'll make you some soup. You certainly look tired out, and no mistake. Then she bolted the door afresh. She put more water in the pot, added butter and potatoes, then, taking down a piece of bacon from a hook in the chimney earner, cut it in two and slipped half of it into the pot. The six men watched her movements with hungry eyes. They had placed their rifles and helmets in a corner and waited for supper, as well behaved as children on a school bench. The old mother had resumed her spinning, casting from time to time a furtive and uneasy glance at the soldiers. Nothing was to be heard save the humming of the wheel, the crackling of the fire, and the singing of the water in the pot. But suddenly, a strange noise, a sound like the harsh breathing of some wild animal sniffing under the door, startled the occupants of the room. The German officer sprang toward the rifles. Berthine stopped him with a gesture and said smilingly, It's only the wolves. They are like you, prowling hungry through the forest. The incredulous man wanted to see with his own eyes, and as soon as the door was opened, he perceived two large greyish animals disappearing with long, swinging trot into the darkness. He returned to his seat, muttering, I wouldn't have believed it, and he waited quietly till supper was ready. The men devoured their meal voraciously, with mouths stretched to their ears that they might swallow the more. Their round eyes opened at the same time as their jaws, and as the soup coursed down their throats, it made a noise like the gurgling of water in a rainpipe. The two women watched in silence the movements of the big red beards. The potatoes seemed to be engulfed in these moving fleeces. But as they were thirsty, the forester's daughter went down to the cellar to draw them some cider. She was gone some time. The cellar was small, with an arched ceiling, and had served, so people said, both as prison and as hiding place during the revolution. It was approached by means of a narrow, winding staircase, closed by a trapdoor at the farther end of the kitchen. When Berthine returned, she was smiling mysteriously to herself. She gave the Germans her jug of cider. Then she and her mother supped apart at the other end of the kitchen. The soldiers had finished eating and were all six falling asleep as they sat round the table. 
Every now and then a forehead fell with a thud on the board, and the man, awakened suddenly, sat upright again. Berthine said to the officer, Go and lie down, all of you, round the fire. There's lots of room for six. I'm going up to my room with my mother. And the two women went upstairs. They could be heard locking the door and walking about overhead for a time. Then they were silent. The Prussians lay down on the floor, with their feet to the fire, and their heads resting on their rolled-up cloaks. Soon all six snored loudly and uninterruptedly in six different keys. They had been sleeping for some time when a shot rang out so loudly that it seemed directed against the very walls of the house. The soldiers rose hastily. Two, then three more shots were fired. The door opened hastily, and Berthine appeared, barefooted and only half-dressed, with her candle in her hand and a scared look on her face. There are the French, she stammered, at least two hundred of them. If they find you here, they'll burn the house down. For God's sake, hurry down into the cellar and don't make a sound, whatever you do. If you make any noise, we are lost. We'll go, we'll go, replied the terrified officer. Which is the way? The young woman hurriedly raised the small, square trapdoor, and the six men disappeared one after another down the narrow, winding staircase, feeling their way as they went. But as soon as the spike of the out of the last helmet was out of sight, Berthine lowered the heavy oaken lid, thick as a wall, hard as steel, furnished with the hinges and bolts of a prison cell, shot the two heavy bolts and began to laugh long and silently, possessed with a mad longing to dance above the heads of her prisoners. They made no sound, enclosed in the cellar as in a strong box, obtaining air only from a small iron barred vent hole. Berthine lighted her fire again, hung the pot over it, and prepared more soup, saying to herself, Father will be tired tonight. Then she sat and waited. The heavy pendulum of the clock swung to and fro with a monotonous tick. Every now and then the young woman cast an impatient glance at the dialer glance, which seemed to say, I wish he'd be quick. But soon there was a sound of voices beneath her feet. Low, confused words reached her through the masonry which roofed the cellar. The Prussians were beginning to suspect the trick she had played them, and presently the officer came up the narrow staircase and knocked at the trap door. Open the door, he cried. What do you want, she said, rising from her seat and approaching the cellarway. Open the door. I won't do any such thing. Open it or I'll break it down, shouted the man angrily. She laughed. Hammer away, my good man. Hammer away! He struck with the butt end of his gun at the closed oaken door, but it would have resisted a battering ram. The forester's daughter heard him go down the stairs again. Then the soldiers came one after another and tried their strength against the trap door. But finding their efforts useless, they all returned to the cellar and began to talk among themselves. The young woman heard them for a short time. Then she rose, opened the door of the house looked out into the night and listened. A sound of distant barking reached her ear. She whistled just as a huntsman would, and almost immediately two great dogs emerged from the darkness and bounded to her side. She held them tight and shouted at the top of her voice, Hello, father! A far-off voice replied, Hello, Berthine! She waited a few seconds, then repeated, Hello, father! The voice, nearer now, replied, Hello, Berthine. Don't go in front of the vent hole, shouted his daughter. There are Prussians in the cellar. Suddenly, the man's tall figure could be seen to the left, standing between two tree trunks. Prussians in the cellar? he asked anxiously. What are they doing? The young woman laughed. They are the same as were here yesterday. They lost their way, and I've given them free lodgings in the cellar. She told the story of how she had alarmed them by firing the revolver and had shut them up in the cellar. The man, still serious, asked, But what am I to do with them at this time of night? Go and fetch Monsieur Lavigne with his men, she replied. He'll take them prisoners. He'll be delighted. Her father smiled. So he will delight it. Here's some soup for you, said his daughter. Eat it quick and then be off. The old keeper sat down at the table and began to eat his soup, 
having first filled two plates and put them on the floor for the dogs. The Prussians, hearing voices, were silent. Long legs set off a quarter of an hour later, and Berthine, with her head between her hands, waited. The prisoners began to make themselves heard again. They shouted, called, and beat furiously with the butts of their muskets against the rigid trap door of the cellar. Then they fired shots through the vent hole, hoping, no doubt, to be heard by any German detachment which chanced to be passing that way. The forester's daughter did not stir, but the noise irritated and unnerved her. Blind anger rose in her heart against the prisoners. She would have been only too glad to kill them all, and so silence them. Then, as her impatience grew, she watched the clock, counting the minutes as they passed. Her father had been gone an hour and a half. He must have reached the town by now. She conjured up a vision of him telling the story to Monsieur Lavigne, who grew pale with emotion and rang for his servant to bring him his arms and uniform. She fancied she could bear the drum as it sounded the call to arms. Frightened faces appeared at the windows. The citizen soldiers emerged from their houses half-dressed, out of breath, buckling on their belts and hurrying to the commandant's house. Then the troop of soldiers, with long legs at its head, set forth through the night and the snow toward the forest. She looked at the clock. They may be here in an hour. A nervous impatience possessed her. The minutes seemed interminable. Would the time never come? At last the clock marked the moment she had fixed on for their arrival, and she opened the door to listen for their approach. She perceived a shadowy form creeping toward the house. She was afraid and cried out, but it was her father. They have sent me, he said, to see if there is any change in the state of affairs. No, none. Then he gave a shrill whistle. Soon a dark mass loomed up under the trees, the advance guard, composed of ten men. Don't go in front of the vent hole, repeated Longlegs at intervals. And the first arrivals pointed out the much dreaded vent hole to those who came after. At last, the main body of the troop arrived, in all two hundred men, each carrying two hundred cartridges. Monsieur Lavigne, in a state of intense excitement, posted them in such a fashion as to surround the whole house, save for a large space left vacant in front of the little hole on a level with the ground, through which the cellar derived its supply of air. Monsieur Lavigne struck the trapdoor a blow with his foot and called, I wish to speak to the Prussian officer. The German did not reply. The Prussian officer, again shouted the commandant. Still no response. For the space of twenty minutes, Monsieur Lavigne called on this silent officer to surrender with bag and baggage, promising him that all lives should be spared and that he and his men should be accorded military honours, but he could extort no sign, either of consent or of defiance. The situation became a puzzling one. The citizen soldiers kicked their heels in the snow, slapping their arms across their chest as cab drivers do to warm themselves and gazing at the vent hole with a growing and childish desire to pass in front of it. At last, one of them took the risker man named Potovin, who was fleet of limb. He ran like a deer across the zone of danger. The experiment succeeded. The prisoners gave no sign of life. A voice cried, There's no one there! and another soldier crossed the open space before the dangerous vent hole. Then this hazardous sport developed into a game. Every minute a man ran swiftly from one side to the other, like a boy playing baseball, kicking up the snow behind him as he ran. They had lighted big fires of dead wood at which to warm themselves, and the figures of the runners were illumined by the flames as they passed rapidly from the camp on the right to that on the left. Someone shouted, it's your turn now, Maloisen. Maloisen was a fat baker whose corpulent person served to point many a joke among his comrades. He hesitated. They chaffed him. Then, nerving himself to the effort, he set off at a little, waddling gait which shook his fat paunch and made the whole detachment laugh till they cried. Bravo, bravo, Maloisen! they shouted for his encouragement. He had accomplished about two-thirds of his journey when a long, crimson flame shot forth from the vent hole. A loud report followed, 
and the fat baker fell face forward to the ground, uttering a frightful scream. No one went to his assistance. Then he was seen to drag himself, groaning on all fours through the snow until he was beyond danger when he fainted. He was shot in the upper part of the thigh. After the first surprise and fright were over, they laughed at him again. But Monsieur Lavigne appeared on the threshold of the forester's dwelling. He had formed his plan of attack. He called in a loud voice, I want Planchu, the plumber, and his workmen. Three men approached. Take the eavesdrops from the roof. In a quarter of an hour they brought the commandant thirty yards of pipes. Next, with infinite precaution, he had a small round hole drilled in the trap door. Then, making a conduit with the troughs from the pump to this opening, he said with an air of extreme satisfaction, Now we'll give these German gentlemen something to drink. A shout of frenzied admiration, mingled with uproarious laughter, burst from his followers, and the commandant organized relays of men who were to relieve one another every five minutes. Then he commanded, Pump! And the pump handle having been set in motion, a stream of water trickled throughout the length of the piping and flowed from step to step down the cellar stairs with a gentle gurgling sound. They waited. An hour passed then two, then three. The commandant, in a state of feverish agitation, walked up and down the kitchen, putting his ear to the ground every now and then to discover, if possible, what the enemy were doing and whether they would soon capitulate. The enemy was astir now. They could be heard moving the casks about, talking, splashing through the water. Then, about eight o'clock in the morning, a voice came from the vent hole. I want to speak to the French officer. Levine replied from the window, taking care not to put his head out too far. Do you surrender? I surrender. Then put your rifles outside. A rifle immediately protruded from the hole and fell into the snow, then another and another until all were disposed of, and the voice which had spoken before said, I have no more. Be quick. I am drowned. Stop pumping ordered the commandant, and the pump handle hung motionless. Then, having filled the kitchen with armed and waiting soldiers, he slowly raised the oaken trap door. Four heads appeared, soaking wet, four fair heads with long sandy hair, and one after another the six Germans emerged, scared, shivering and dripping from head to foot. They were seized and bound, then, as the French feared a surprise, they set off at once in two convoys, one in charge of the prisoners and the other conducting Maloison on a mattress borne on poles. They made a triumphal entry into Rethel. Monsieur Lavigne was decorated as a reward for having captured a Prussian advance guard, and the fat baker received the military medal for wounds received at the hands of the enemy. The Coward, a short story by Guy de Maupassant. In society, he was called Handsome Signol. His name was Vicomte Gontran Joseph de Signol. An orphan and possessed of an ample fortune, he cut quite a dash, as it is called. He had an attractive appearance and manner, could talk well, had a certain inborn elegance, an air of pride and nobility, a good moustache and a tender eye that always finds favour with women. He was in great request at receptions, waltzed to perfection, and was regarded by his own sex with that smiling hostility accorded to the popular society man. He had been suspected of more than one love affair, calculated to enhance the reputation of a bachelor. He lived a happy, peaceful life, a life of physical and mental well-being. He had won considerable fame as a swordsman and still more as a marksman. When the time comes for me to fight a duel, he said, I shall choose pistols. With such a weapon, I am sure to kill my man. One evening, having accompanied two women friends of his with their husbands to the theatre, 
He invited them to take some ice cream at Tortoni's after the performance. They had been seated a few minutes in the restaurant when Signoles noticed that a man was staring persistently at one of the ladies. She seemed annoyed and lowered her eyes. At last, she said to her husband, There's a man over there looking at me. I don't know him, do you? The husband, who had noticed nothing, glanced across at the offender and said, No, not in the least. His wife continued, half smiling, half angry. It's very tiresome. He quite spoils my ice cream. The husband shrugged his shoulders. Nonsense. Don't take any notice of him. If we were to bother our heads about all the ill-mannered people, we should have no time for anything else. But the vicomte abruptly left his seat. He could not allow this insolent fellow to spoil an ice for a guest of his. It was for him to take cognizance of the offence, since it was through him that his friends had come to the restaurant. He went across to the man and said, Sir, you are staring at those ladies in a manner I cannot permit. I must ask you to desist from your rudeness. The other replied, Let me alone, will you? Take care, sir, said the vicomte between his teeth, or you will force me to extreme measures. The man replied with a single word, a foul word, which could be heard from one end of the restaurant to the other, and which startled everyone there. All those whose backs were toward the two disputants turned round. All the others raised their heads. Three waiters spun round on their heels like tops. The two lady cashiers jumped as if shot, then turned their bodies simultaneously like two automata worked by the same spring. There was dead silence. Then suddenly, a sharp, crisp sound. The vicomte had slapped his adversary's face. Everyone rose to interfere. Cards were exchanged. When the vicomte reached home, he walked rapidly up and down his room for some minutes. He was in a state of too great agitation to think connectedly. One idea alone possessed him, a duel. But this idea aroused in him as yet no emotion of any kind. He had done what he was bound to do. He had proved himself to be what he ought to be. He would be talked about, approved, congratulated. He repeated aloud, speaking as one does when under the stress of great mental disturbance. What a brute of a man! Then he sat down and began to reflect. He would have to find seconds as soon as morning came. Whom should he choose? He bethought himself of the most influential and best-known men of his acquaintance. His choice fell at last on the Marquis de la Tour Noire and Colonel Bourdin a nobleman and a soldier. That would be just the thing. Their names would carry weight in the newspapers. He was thirsty and drank three glasses of water, one after another. Then he walked up and down again. If he showed himself brave, determined, prepared to face a duel in deadly earnest, his adversary would probably draw back and proffer excuses. He picked up the card he had taken from his pocket and thrown on a table. He read it again, as he had already read it, first at a glance in the restaurant and afterward on the way home in the light of each gas lamp. Georges Lamille, 51 Rue Moncey. That was all. He examined closely this collection of letters, which seemed to him mysterious, fraught with many meanings. Georges Lamille, who was the man? What was his profession? Why had he stared so at the woman? Was it not monstrous that a stranger, an unknown, should thus all at once upset one's whole life, simply because it had pleased him to stare rudely at a woman? And the vicomte once more repeated aloud, What a brute! Then he stood motionless, thinking, his eyes still fixed on the card. Anger rose in his heart against this scrap of paper, a resentful anger mingled with a strange sense of uneasiness. It was a stupid business altogether. He took up a penknife which lay open within reach and deliberately stuck it into the middle of the printed name as if he were stabbing someone. So he would have to fight. Should he choose swords or pistols? for he considered himself as the insulted party. With the sword, he would risk less, but with the pistol, there was some chance of his adversary backing out. A duel with swords is rarely fatal, since mutual prudence prevents the combatants from fighting close enough to each other for a point to enter very deep. With pistols, he would seriously risk his life, 
but on the other hand, he might come out of the affair with flying colours and without a duel after all. I must be firm, he said. The fellow will be afraid. The sound of his own voice startled him, and he looked nervously round the room. He felt unstrung. He drank another glass of water and then began undressing, preparatory to going to bed. As soon as he was in bed, he blew out the light and shut his eyes. I have all day tomorrow, he reflected, for setting my affairs in order. I must sleep now in order to be calm when the time comes. He was very warm in bed, but he could not succeed in losing consciousness. He tossed and turned, remained for five minutes lying on his back, then changed to his left side, then rolled over to his right. He was thirsty again and rose to drink. Then a qualm seized him. Can it be possible that I am afraid? Why did his heart beat so uncontrollably at every well-known sound in his room? When the clock was about to strike, the prefatory grating of its spring made him start, and for several seconds he panted for breath, so unnerved was he. He began to reason with himself on the possibility of such a thing. Could I by any chance be afraid? No, indeed, he could not be afraid, since he was resolved to proceed to the last extremity since he was irrevocably determined to fight without flinching. And yet, he was so perturbed in mind and body that he asked himself, Is it possible to be afraid in spite of oneself? And this doubt, this fearful question, took possession of him. If an irresistible power, stronger than his own will, were to quell his courage, what would happen? He would certainly go to the place appointed, his will would force him that far, but supposing, when there, he were to tremble or faint, and he thought of his social standing, his reputation, his name, and he suddenly determined to get up and look at himself in the glass. He lighted his candle. When he saw his face reflected in the mirror, he scarcely recognized it. He seemed to see before him a man whom he did not know. His eyes looked disproportionately large, and he was very pale. He remained standing before the mirror. He put out his tongue as if to examine the state of his health, and all at once the thought flashed into his mind. At this time, the day after tomorrow, I may be dead. And his heart throbbed painfully. At this time, the day after tomorrow, I may be dead. This person in front of me, this. I, whom I see in the glass, will perhaps be no more. What? Here I am, I look at myself. I feel myself to be alive, and yet in twenty-four hours I may be lying on that bed with closed eyes, dead, cold, inanimate. He turned round and could see himself distinctly lying on his back on the couch he had just quitted. He had the hollow face and the limp hands of death. Then he became afraid of his bed, and to avoid seeing it went to his smoking room. He mechanically took a cigar, lighted it, and began walking back and forth. He was cold. He took a step toward the bell to wake his valet, but stopped with hand raised toward the bell rope. He would see that I am afraid. And instead of ringing, he made a fire himself. His hands quivered nervously as they touched various objects. His head grew dizzy, his thoughts confused, disjointed, painful. A numbness seized his spirit, as if he had been drinking and all the time he kept on saying, What shall I do? What will become of me? His whole body trembled spasmodically. He rose and, going to the window, drew back the curtains. The day, a summer day, was breaking. The pink sky cast a glow on the city, its roofs and its walls. A flush of light enveloped the awakened world like a caress from the rising sun, and the glimmer of dawn kindled new hope in the breast of the vicomte. What a fool he was to let himself succumb to fear before anything was decided, before his seconds had interviewed those of Georges Lamille, before he even knew whether he would have to fight or not. He bathed, dressed, and left the house with a firm step. He repeated as he went, I must be firm, very firm. I must show that I am not afraid. His seconds, the Marquis and the Colonel, placed themselves at his disposal, and having shaken him warmly by the hand, began to discuss details. 
You want a serious duel? asked the colonel. Yes, quite serious, replied the vicomte. You insist on pistols, put in the marquis. Yes. Do you leave all the other arrangements in our hands? With a dry, jerky voice, the vicomte answered, Twenty paces, at a given signal, the arm to be raised, not lowered, shots to be exchanged until one or other is seriously wounded. Excellent conditions, declared the colonel in a satisfied tone. You are a good shot. All the chances are in your favor. And they parted. The vicomte returned home to wait for them. His agitation, only temporarily allayed, now increased momentarily. He felt, in arms, legs, and chest, a sort of trembling, a continuous vibration. He could not stay still, either sitting or standing. His mouth was parched, and he made every now and then a clicking movement of the tongue, as if to detach it from his palate. He attempted to take luncheon, but could not eat. Then it occurred to him to seek courage in drink, and he sent for a decanter of rum, of which he swallowed, one after another, six small glasses. A burning warmth, followed by a deadening of the mental faculties, ensued. He said to himself, I know how to manage. Now it will be all right. But at the end of an hour he had emptied the decanter, and his agitation was worse than ever. A mad longing possessed him to throw himself on the ground, to bite, to scream. Night fell. A ring at the bell so unnerved him that he had not the strength to rise to receive his seconds. He dared not even to speak to them, wish them good day, utter a single word, lest his changed voice should betray him. All is arranged as you wished, said the colonel. Your adversary claimed at first the privilege of the offended part, but he yielded almost at once and accepted your conditions. His seconds are two military men. Thank you, said the vicomte. The marquis added, Please excuse us if we do not stay now, for we have a good deal to see to yet. We shall want a reliable doctor, since the duel is not to end until a serious wound has been inflicted, and you know that bullets are not to be trifled with. We must select a spot near some house to which the wounded party can be carried if necessary. In fact, the arrangements will take us another two or three hours at least. The vicomte articulated for the second time. Thank you. You're all right, asked the colonel. Quite calm? Perfectly calm, thank you. The two men withdrew. When he was once more alone, he felt as though he should go mad. His servant, having lighted the lamps, he sat down at his table to write some letters. When he had traced at the top of a sheet of paper the words, This is my last will and testament, he started from his seat, feeling himself incapable of connected thought, of decision in regard to anything. So he was going to fight. He could no longer avoid it. What, then, possessed him? He wished to fight, he was fully determined to fight, and yet, in spite of all his mental effort, in spite of the exertion of all his willpower, he felt that he could not even preserve the strength necessary to carry him through the ordeal. He tried to conjure up a picture of the duel, his own attitude, and that of his enemy. Every now and then his teeth chattered audibly. He thought he would read, and took down Chateau Villard's rules of dueling. Then he said, is the other man practiced in the use of the pistol? Is he well known? How can I find out? He remembered Baron de Vaux's book on marksmen and searched it from end to end. Georges Lamille was not mentioned. And yet, if he were not an adept, would he have accepted without demure such a dangerous weapon and such deadly conditions? He opened a case of Gastine Renette, which stood on a small table and took from it a pistol. Next, he stood in the correct attitude for firing and raised his arm. But he was trembling from head to foot, and the weapon shook in his grasp. Then he said to himself, It is impossible. I cannot fight like this. He looked at the little black, death-spitting hole at the end of the pistol. He thought of dishonor, of the whispers at the clubs, the smiles in his friends' drawing rooms, the contempt of women the veiled sneers of the newspapers, the insults that would be hurled at him by cowards. He still looked at the weapon, and raising the hammer, saw the glitter of the priming below it. The pistol had been left loaded by some chance, some oversight, and the discovery rejoiced him.
he knew not why. If he did not maintain, in presence of his opponent, the steadfast bearing which was so necessary to his honour, he would be ruined forever. He would be branded, stigmatised as a coward, hounded out of society, and he felt he knew that he could not maintain that calm, unmoved demeanour. And yet he was brave, since the thought that followed was not even rounded to a finish in his mind, but opening his mouth wide, he suddenly plunged the barrel of the pistol as far back as his throat and pressed the trigger. When the valet, alarmed at the report, rushed into the room, he found his master lying dead upon his back. A spurt of blood had splashed the white paper on the table and had made a great crimson stain beneath the words, This is my last will and testament.